Hi, uh, good evening everyone. So today we are going to start or rather continue with our discussion on various drugs which are used in dermatology. And uh, this evening we are going to we are going to discuss one of the most important drugs that we routinely use in dermatology. That is systemic corticosteroids. Now you need to understand that as a dermatologist, you need to be very familiar about all sorts of all different kinds of corticosteroids and where and when to use them and more importantly how much to use them so because this is a very vast topic i have divided into a few parts part one will deal with what are steroids and how do they act what are their major mechanisms of action what are their uses in dermatology while in the next part we'll be discussing how do they cause the adverse effects and how to handle those adverse effects now most of us are scared or rather the newer dermatologists, and I consider myself as one of those also. Newer dermatologists have a certain fear of using corticosteroids, and more than us, patients are very scared of using corticosteroids. And as a result, you will keep on get, uh, coming across patients who don't want to use any form of steroids, and it's our job to counsel them so that wherever there is an indication of steroids, and in our opinion, it would help them, in managing their disease we should be able to comfort them and use steroids very judiciously so that we can help them with the least of side effects and for that we need to be very well familiar with all sorts of steroids and why are we going to give it for how long should we give it what are the most common adverse events associated with the use of steroids how long can we give safely in the in those patients and for that, we are going to gradually, over the course of next few videos, we'll discuss how to use systemic corticosteroids in dermatology. Okay, so with that, we're going to, we're going to start with corticosteroids. So just a little introduction about these uh, molecules. They were initially found, uh, you know, synthesized by the name of compound E, which was actually cortisone in the year 1935. And this was done by the scientist Kendall. And in the in around about 1940s, they were being, you know, started to use corticosteroids in various other disorders. So much so that in 1950, it was given the Nobel Prize in, phys in physiology or medicine when corticosteroids were used to treat a woman of rheumatoid arthritis. And because of that, it was, uh, it was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1950. Now, there's one more scientist name that you will come across, and please pardon me if the spelling is incorrect. It's Sulzberger, and Sulzberger is majorly responsible for the introduction of steroids in treatment of various inflammatory dermatosis. Okay, so it was he who kind of start open the door to use of this uh, steroid combination, steroid compounds to be used in dermatology. Prior to that, it was only used to manage predominantly pain in arthritis and the, as a pan immunosuppressant for various inflammatory and immune mediated disorders. Now I've included two lines in this slide and these lines are verbatim from Wolverton, fourth edition and this kind of summarizes the essence of this presentation. So as the list of corticosteroid responsive dermatosis grew, so did the list of potential adverse events. That means the more we started using it, the more we come across different kinds of serious to non-serious adverse events. So we need to know uh, how uh, how steroids would lead to certain kind of adverse events and first how to manage it second how to prevent them from happening and third how to counsel patients so that we together with the patient will be able to use steroid judiciously now second line is the physician who is thoroughly familiar with these measures will use systemic corticosteroids more comfortably and wisely to benefit of many grateful patients so if you use steroids comfortably if you are able to use steroids to take care of your patients, you will have many patients who are grateful for your introduction of steroids. And you can only do that, or rather we all can only do that when we know somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, we have a clear understanding of steroids and how they work and what are the specific indications in which steroids can be used. Steroids essentially are pan-immunosuppressors, okay? They're going to suppress everything in the immune system. And because of that, it's more of a uh, hit or a hit or treat phenomena 
or Wolverton mentions a line which is known as uh, it's I think it's a treat and retreat treat and retreat it means that you start steroids early in adequate doses make sure the patient is comfortable and after the patient is comfortable you start to withdraw steroids and stop it and I would like I like to use the word hit and retreat that means you use, you use the adequate dose no half measures treat it in good amount of steroids and try to re remove the patient from steroids as quickly as the clinical disease allows us so that the patient might have less side effects in the long run okay so we'll start by first looking at the structure of steroids and we are going to use the prototype hydrocortisone also known as cortisol now this is the prototype structure of steroids and it is consists it consists of three hexane rings hexane means six carbon rings so that's one hexane ring second and third and one pentane ring which means five carbon containing rings so these are the basic structure of a steroid molecule and more further modifications of this structure gives us all sorts of different steroids which are used either systemically, orally, intralesionally, intradermally, all sorts of steroids, even topically, all are modification of this basic structure. Okay. So remember that on the 11th position here, okay, on the 11th position, if you have a ketone group, a ketone group, then this is known as cortisone. Okay, and this cortisone has to be converted to cortisol for it to be biologically active. So 11 carbon has a ketone group, it is inactive. It has to be converted to an 11 hydroxyl group. This is the 11 hydroxyl group for it to be active. This conversion is, is done by 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. This is the most important enzyme in steroid action. So 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. What it does is the conversion of the ketone group to a hydroxyl group increases the glucocorticoid activity. And glucocorticoid activity, we'll be discussing in subsequent slides, is the major activity responsible for decreasing the immune system. Okay. So it increases the glucocorticoid activity. That means make it makes it makes the molecule more potent and it decreases the metabolic degradation so that it remains in the system for a longer duration. And this 11 hydroxy group is necessary for topical action. So most of the topical steroids or rather all of the topical steroids that you, you're going to use or see in daily practice have, have, have an 11 hydroxyl group in them. And that is necessary for topical action too. Plus the addition of 11 hydroxyl group decreases the degradation. So it remains longer in contact with the skin so that the, uh, the effect is prolonged. Okay. Now, one more thing is that whenever, uh, whenever a second group, a second group, second group is the base of a steroid molecule. For example, I'll be using few trade names, but there is no conflict of interest. For example, betanoate is betamethasone valerate. So first part is steroid betamethasone. Second part is the base, which is valerate. Now, wherever the valerate or the base attaches, it forms a stereochemical plane. For example, this is the steroid. It has all uh, pentane and hexane rings, and this is the base. So, if it is attaching, it is it forms a plane. And if further groups are added into the steroid molecule, if it is away from the receptor attaching site, then it is known as an alpha group, which is attached. If the new group, for example, let let that be an addition of a methyl group or additional chlorine or additional uh, additional hydroxyl group, we'll be seeing them in further structures. If the addition of a new specific group is to away from the receptor of steroids, it becomes an alpha, or if it is towards the receptor, it becomes a beta. Okay, so just a nomenclature, so that you'll be, ha you have some understanding where the group is getting attached. Now this conversion happens in the liver, a hepatic conversion, and it is, done by CYP3A4 enzyme, one of the most cytochrome, cytochrome P450 group of enzymes. And again, uh, we delve into the territory of various enzyme, sorry, various drug interactions, whosoever is either inducing or decreasing the activity of CYP has an effect on steroid metabolism. Plus long-standing liver disease can also lead to decreased conversion or maybe decreased metabolism also of steroid molecules leading to further adverse effects. That's one more point to be taken care of. 
Okay. So pre in the previous slide, we have discussed the importance of 11 hydroxyl group. This is this conversion is categorized, uh, sorry, star, cat catalyzed by 11 beta hydroxyl steroid dehydrogenase in the liver. So after the addition of hydroxyl group at the 11th position, further addition at 17th position of another hydroxyl group masks the uh, molecule and decreases its mineralocorticoid activity. So we'll, uh, we'll see in subsequent structures when the OH group gets attached to 17th position, the mineralocorticoid activity decreases. And when we'll be discussing the effects of steroids, we'll realize what how helpful it is to decrease the mineralocorticoid activity and increase the glucocorticoid activity, okay? Addition, addition of a fluorine group at the ninth position leads to a molecule known as fludrocortisone. Okay, addition of a fluoride group and ninth position, it increases the glucocorticoid activity with significant mineralocorticoid activity too. Okay, so addition of, addition of fluorine group and ninth position also increases the glucocorticoid activity of the steroid molecule. If a methyl group is attached at the 16th position, it forms a steroid triamcinolone. Okay, and when we'll be discussing the uh, relative half-life, relative potency, relative duration of activity will realize the importance of addition of these new compounds at these specific locations. So addition of a hydroxyl group at 16th position leads to a molecule known as tramcinolone and we know that uh, this molecule via routine intradermal injections for steroids. Now this addition of hydroxyl molecule at the 16th position increases, further increases the glucocorticoid activity and decreases the mineralocorticoid activity. Okay. If, if that hydroxyl group in, instead is replaced by a methyl group, it forms two very long-acting steroid molecules, dexamethasone and betamethasone. Okay. Now, uh, as we were discussing earlier, when the second part of the steroid molecule is attached to the steroid, it forms a stereochemical plane. Okay. Now, this stereochemical plane, if it is, uh, let's say, uh, if it is towards the observer from the stereochemical plane, it will form dexamethasone. If the addition of this methyl group is away from the stereochemical plane, it forms a betamethasone group. And this is the only difference. Another difference is that betamethasone lacks non-genomic activity. And we'll discuss that when we'll be discussing the mechanism of action of steroids. Just remember for now that betamethasone does not have non-genomic activity. So that's one more difference between DEXA and betamethasone. Now this is the molecule which we are much more familiar in a routine practice or rather the, the next molecule which is prednisolone that in, for which we are very much familiar and we use it routinely in our daily practice. Now if you remember that there was not, there, there wasn't a double bond here in hydrocortisone but the addition of this double bond leads to increased glucocorticoid activity. So there's increased glucocorticoid action. Now you will observe that when we are moving from one molecule to another, there's increase in glucocorticoid activity with further decreasing in mineralocorticoid. So you'll realize that all of the steroids and with these are majorly oral steroids like prednisone and methylprednisolone we'll find that we require much more of glucocorticoid activity because remember in few slides back we discussed that glucocorticoids are responsible for the immunosuppressive effects while the mineralocorticoid has a lot of a uh, lot of you know, effects on blood pressure and the aldosterone system we'll be discussing them them in after three post slides okay so we are we are kind of increasing the glucocorticoid levels for having that immunosuppressive effects while further decreasing the mineralocorticoid effect because we don't want mineralocorticoid effects in steroids. Now in, in prednisone, the 11th position had a ketone group. The 11th position had a ketone group and when it is catabolized by the 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase, this ketone group becomes a hydroxyl group. Okay, so this 11 position is then occupied by a hydroxyl group and then it becomes from prednisone to prednisolone. 
and this is a steroid which we routinely use in our practice okay now remember that prednisolone already has a 11 beta 11 hydroxy group so because of that prednisone is act prednisolone is active so when giving orally you need not worry about using using steroids in uh, liver disease patients and need not worry about its proper conversion from on compound to ol compound and it is metabolically active as it is because it already has a 11 hydroxy group if we have a methyl group attached here it becomes methyl prednisolone okay and using methyl prednisolone the, the potency of this steroid is now five times cortisol for prednisolone without the methyl group the potency is four times cortisol so we have increased it by one factor more just by adding a methyl group here so methyl prednisolone is slightly more potent than methyl than prednisolone which itself is four times potent than the activity of cortisol clear so in previous slides we have learned about structure of most commonly used steroids regarding tramsinolone dexamethasone betamethasone prednisolone methylprednisolone hydrocortisone so we have a bit of idea what secondary groups are being attached in those steroid backbone and how progressively we are having an increased glucocorticoid activity and with further decrease in mineralocorticoid activity let's discuss pharmacology now the absorption happens in the upper jejunum bioavailability for prednisone is 50 percent so every other steroid has different bioavailability we're just taking we are taking prednisone as an uh, prototype steroid here and it's 50 percent for prednisone peak plasma level occurs about 30 to 100 minutes after intake and that is also different for different molecules but the activity doesn't correlate well with half lives so subsequently when we'll be discussing the different half lives or the different duration of activity of other uh, different different kind of steroids we will have a short acting steroids intermediate acting steroids and long acting steroids the activity of a particular steroid doesn't correlate well with their half lives okay just just a point to remember that just because a steroid has a longer half life doesn't mean it is more active than any other any other steroid we might go in detail when we'll be discussing steroid pulses in the future now one more molecule you need to know about is known as cortisol binding globulin so it's a globulin so previously we have read about various immunosuppressors and they were bind, bound to plasma proteins majorly albumin here we see another molecule known as cortisol binding globulin and it's a binding protein also known by the name of transcortin transportation of cortisone okay so you can remember like this so what essentially happens is that you have a molecule and this is cortisol binding cortisol binding globulin and then you have this little bit of steroid molecule okay and this steroid molecule is roughly about 80 to 90 percent bound to this molecule this cbg the rest rest 10 percent of free steroid is responsible for the physiological activity of that steroid and this is not a static number it can vary you can have one percent of the steroid free or ten percent or even three percent it can go it's very variable just remember that approximately 80 to 90 percent of cortisol we are talking about cortisol so 80 to 90 percent cortisol is bound to cortisol binding globulin and this is the major transporter of cortison, cort, uh, cortisol in the blood system clear it has a low capacity and high affinity that means it selectively binds steroids with a good attachment but the amount of steroids that one molecule can grasp is low okay so low capacity but high affinity for steroids so it acts as a good storage albumin also binds steroid uh, steroid molecules and it has a very high capacity but low affinity that means it might bind it might not bind the affinity is not that strong with steroid but it can it has a capacity to hold a larger amount of steroids bound to it okay just a fact but remember that the major transporting protein is cortisol binding globulin
So since cortisol binding globulin is one of the major transporting proteins, we need to have a somewhat clear understanding of the disorders which might increase or decrease cortisol binding globulin. And since the level of CBG, if it increases, is going to bound a lot of steroid molecule because the affinity is high and it will lead to further decrease in the free steroid molecule and thus decrease in the clinical efficacy. If we turn this whole process opposite and you have disorders that are going to decrease CBG, there will be more free steroid available, high clinical efficacy, but high adverse events also. Okay. So conditions with decreased cortisol binding globulin include hypothyroidism, liver disease because CBG is going to be made by the liver. Okay. Renal disease because of loss of globulins, obesity. Okay. Conditions which are associated with an increased cortisol binding globulin are estrogen therapies, pregnancy, hyperthyroidism. Okay. So we can think about that during pregnancy we might have or we might have a flare up of autoimmune diseases. And this could be somewhat explained that in, that there is an increased CBG. Increased CBG binds more cortisol. Less free cortisol is available for its action, and because of that, there is a slight flare up in pregnancy. That's just one of the explanations. There are multiple explanations why autoimmune diseases behave the way they do in a pregnant female. Now we'll discuss about metabolism and excretion. Just to cut it short, excretion is done via kidneys and it's more or less an unchanged molecule. It, it is passed unchanged from the kidneys. Okay. Again, we are going to discuss about the most important enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. We have told you that the conversion happens in the liver. It has two major isoforms, type 1 and type 2 isoform. Type 1 is the one which is responsible of convert for converting ketone group to a hydroxyl group. And when that conversion happens, the steroid molecule is now active. It has high glucocorticoid activity with a low mineralocorticoid activity. Clear? And this is the steroid we want in our system for its eff effects. Type 2 isoform actually negates this conversion. It converts the hydroxyl group back to the ketone molecule and thus decreases the glucocorticoid activity and increases the mineralocorticoid activity. And this balance between the type 1 isoform and type 2 isoform is somewhat responsible for different organs having different effects when they are exposed to steroids. Okay, but majorly this isoform predominates, uh, predominates and the ketone group is perfectly converted to a hydroxyl group and the immunosuppressive action takes place. <clears throat> now this table uh, might be the most important table and the most daunting table at the same time. And uh, even I have difficulty remembering this when I was a resident. I still have some difficulty in remembering this. You're not supposed to remember it. Just keep on seeing it and slowly and slowly it will get ingrained. Okay. So we divide these steroids into two in three groups, short acting, intermediate acting and long acting. Remember that cortisone and cortisol like hydrocortisone are short acting. Now remember your internship days. If a person is there in septic shock and the endogenous steroids which are produced by the body are not able to take care of the stress at that time, hydrocortisone is given three times a day. It's 100 milligrams three times a day, round about the same dose. Now, if a steroid drug is being given three times a day, then of course it is short acting. So you can remember by that. Okay. So cortisone and cortisol are short acting. Dexamethasone, you remember from DP, dexamethasone pulse or DCP. And betamethasone, you can remember from OMP. So these are OMP is given once a week, while DP and DCP are given three days, sorry, three days a month. So if a steroid molecule is to be given three days a month only, or if a steroid molecule is supposed to be given uh, two, two days a week, so it will be over the weekend, two days a week, that means they are long acting steroids. Okay, that's all steroids that we routinely use come in intermediate acting. That includes prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone, transmenone. Clear? 
so now they should, they will not be any difficulty in remembering what is uh, what short is in which category short intermediate or long now one thing that you have to remember that mineralo corticoid potency decreases when we go from short to sorry when we go from short to long acting again coming back to the septic shock example during internship in septic shock shock means hypotension we need to increase blood pressure of the patient so we need a molecule which has significant mineralo corticoid activity clear and the drug that we use is hydrocortisone so remember that hydrocortisone has significant mineralo corticoid activity and if it is significant mineralo corticoid activity of course when we move down is going to decrease because we routinely use methylprednisolone and we don't require any mineralo corticoid activity in those steroids remember when we were discussing the structures subsequently the mineralo corticoid activity was decreasing so as we move from short acting steroids to long acting steroids the mineralo corticoid activity decreases rest all is going to increase that means the glucocorticoid potency increases that means the steroid becomes more potent regarding the glucocorticoid effects the plasma half life increases it is around about 10 times it increases around about 10 times the biological half life increases roughly 8 to 9 times so we can somewhat remember any steroid which is supposed to be given once a month so, uh, sorry three times three days a month or two days a week will necessarily have a, a higher half life a drug which is supposed to be given three times a day will have naturally a shorter half life so we'll remember that and since methylprednisolone prednisone are given daily orally so you can say that around about half life is about 24 hours so it's easier to remember now the problem arises when we are remembering the conversion rate and it is be best idea to keep on converting when you are, you are seeing patients in opd and that is how you learn otherwise you just you are going to mess up the conversion rates apart from that there is a deflazacort and deflazacort is also one steroid which people routinely use i don't use it that much only very restricted conditions my drug of choice would be prednisolone or methylprednisolone in routine activity and beta methasone in omp dexain pulse okay so deflazacort the physiological dose is about 6 to 9 and the uh, the plasma sorry, <clears throat> the plasma the biological half life is roughly about 5 hours just an additional steroid point okay so now we are going to discuss how essentially this steroid molecule acts they act by various mechanism and i am not underestimating it it is actually various mechanisms it is quite an umbrella immunosuppressant a pan immunosuppressant is going to act on multiple organs multiple cell lines and we'll just try to summarize how it acts okay and just listen to it carefully in the end i'll give you a mnemonic to remember the major major headings rest all we will we can easily extrapolate now glucocorticoid receptor is the most important receptor responsible for nearly all the actions of a steroid molecule it's only one kind of receptor but has many isoforms and that might also explain the differential effects steroid has on different organ systems so it's a cytosolic receptor that means in a cell this is the nucleus the receptor lies in in active dimer forms in the cytosol there is also a receptor which is membrane bound and we'll discuss them subsequently don't worry we'll discuss in brief so it's a cytosolic receptor that means it is in cytoplasm and it is ubiquitous now what ubiquitous means it means present throughout so glucocorticoid receptor is present throughout in each and every cell of the body so the action of steroid is to all the organ and that is why the side effects are also involving all different kind of organs so remember that it is only one receptor which is present everywhere now what essentially happens is that you have a inactive steroid receptor or let me use a different color so you have a steroid receptor as a dimer form and in that steroid receptor you have the steroid molecule which gets attached and you have the dna inside the nucleus this is the nuclear membrane 
Now, what essentially happens is that after attachment of steroid molecule in the cytosol with the glucocorticoid receptor, this receptor is going to go inside and attach itself to GRE. This is GRE. GRE is glucocorticoid receptor response elements. And when this whole unit gets attached to GRE, it will lead to increased translation of various other protein molecules, sorry, increased transcription of various protein cyto and molecules and cytokines. Okay. And this steroid, uh, and because of this steroids, all of the cytokines, uh, the, the cytokines as which are supposed to be normally released are inhibited. Okay. And this is how glucocorticoid receptor and glucocorticoid um, complex leads to its effect. So in short, steroid molecule will bind to a glucocorticoid receptor, activating it. These receptors then migrates to, glu to glucocorticoid response elements and leads to activation of multiple genes, which are going to release multiple anti-inflammatory cytokines and also decrease the translation and, and transcription of various inflammatory cytokines. So inflammatory cytokines will decrease and in uh, the immunosuppressive cytokines will increase okay now glucocorticoid receptor is the most important receptor responsible for the immunomodulatory action additionally there is activation of other transcription factors like nfk beta ifk beta and ap1 so uh, we uh, activate them and in subsequent slide we'll discuss how these leads to various steroid effects and this is responsible of for genomic effect so as, as previously we were mentioning that two kinds of receptors are there, cytosolic and membrane bound. The cytosolic receptor, cytosolic receptor is responsible for genomic effect. The membrane is for non-genomic effect and non-genomic effect happens at higher doses. Higher doses while in lower doses first the genomic effect takes place. More or less there is a considerable overlap in, between genomic and non-genomic. It's just that genomic effect takes place through the glucocorticoid response elements, while the non-genomic has additional additional uh, uh, parameters or additional processes going on. Okay, and non-genomic effect occurs when the steroid dose is high, which is seen in methyl prednisolone pulses, or even steroid uh, dexa pulses or beta methylone or uh, sorry dexa pulses IV or IV methyl prednisolone pulse. Okay, while more or less the steroid molecules will exert its genomic effect. Clear? Now, this is one of the most important table once again. So we have read about one table which was classification of steroids on the basis of activity. And this table tells us about the effects of steroids. So we need to know this effect. And when we we'll know this effect, we we'll know what the clinical effects of steroids is there in a patient and how it leads to various adverse events. So this will tell you exactly how a steroid is supposed to be used what what body parameter or body process we are targeting and if a patient is developing side effects why they are developing side effects clear now the glucocorticoid effect is responsible for providing glucose to the body and most essentially glucose to the brain so it is it's supposed to make sure that a sub, a good supply of glucose is there to the brain so energy supply has to be proper. So how it does that? It, it has its most important action on glucose metabolism. It starts gluconeogenesis. That means new glucose molecules starts forming at the expense of protein and fat. So protein and fats are, are destroyed and converted into glucose molecule for the body to use. Okay. Peripheral insulin resistance. So what insulin does is Insulin is going to take glucose from cytosol and put it into vacuole so that the cell is not able to use it. If it increases peripheral insulin resistance, the cells are not able to take up glucose properly because insulin is resistant. That means glucose is not taken up by cells properly. That means cells are not utilizing glucose. That means more glucose is available in the bloodstream. So this also in increases glucose in the bloodstream. This also increases glucose in the bloodstream and the glycogen storage in liver also increases, increases. This is a bit counterintuitive point, but the increased glucose and glycogen means that body is now gearing up and storing energy in ready to use forms 
so that they can tackle any stress so any stress any inflammation any pain can be tackled when you have good amount of glucose in your body which you can utilize for energy very quickly and very efficiently so glucocorticoid on its effect on glucose metabolism will try to shift the body to that state now for lipid metabolism it leads to lipolysis and increases the triglycerides too now triglycerides as a source of energy so there will be increased triglyceride or triglyceridemia and that is one of the side effects that we see with the derangement of lipids there is also fat redistribution to central locations and that is the cause of buffalo hump okay the buffalo hump that we see and along with cushingoid or moon faces and all those along with of course edema so cushingoid faces and the kind of a buffalo hump uh, at the back of the neck this is one this is because of redistribution of fats to more central areas increase abdominal obesity okay along with that the regulation of above process is by the acth and this we are talking about normal physiology and the physiology the normal physiological process is exaggerated when we give exogenous steroids okay so this is how normal steroid acts and this will get increased when we give steroids to our patient okay additionally now we'll discuss mineral corticoid effect now what mineral corticoid does is it is supposed to maintain blood pressure that is its job maintaining blood pressure and that it does by doing the sodium and potassium balance okay so aldosterone is the mineral corticoid which we secrete endogenously which is secreted by the adrenal glands and the major effect is the sodium and water retention this effect is primarily at the proximal tubule where sodium is taken in inside the body again in exchange of potassium so potassium is excreted along with sodium and that is why you have hypernatremia on steroids and hypokalemia when the patient is on high dose steroids that is why during iv steroid pulses you need to have an electrolyte levels done of sodium and potassium number 1 number 2 that this was also a justification given why steroids are mixed in sorry in iv steroid pulses they are given in uh, dextrose and not dns so uh, in uh, dns because it will increase the sodium amount in the body so because of this was one justification given additionally whenever your patient is taking high dose steroids tell them to have a coconut water it is very good source of potassium or have bananas so this will take care of hypokalemia and this uh, just side tracking a bit this known as oral betanisol pulse also in which 100 mg of beta methasone is crushed and mixed with coconut water and drunk 3 days in a month like a normal pulse we may discuss it in future videos just to mention here now these are aldosterone mineral corticoid effects okay now endogenous cortisol that means the steroid which is secreted by adrenals on its own does have a mineral corticoid effect but slightly less than what aldosterone does number 1 number 2 remember that acth who is controlling the glucocorticoid effects has no role in aldosterone production that is controlled by the renin angiotensin the system and the potassium levels so for maintaining blood pressure we know that renin angiotensin system is a very important system in the proximal tubule which leads to a proper control of blood pressure and and that is the is the the control is mediated by aldosterone and acth the adrenal corticotropic hormone is not responsible for this mineral corticoid action clear so when we understand this table we understand nearly all adverse events of steroids increasing sodium while decreasing potassium leads to water retention leads to edema increase weight gain combine that with the lipid deposition will lead to your cushing faces cushing habitus and all sorts of thing uh, increase blood pressure now hypertension is a very dreaded and very important adverse event and that is because of the inadvertent mineral corticoid activity we'll discuss both of this effects and maybe this table again when we'll be discussing the adverse events of steroids now initially we have discussed glucocorticoid receptor now we'll see how steroids act by the nfk beta and ifk beta pathway
Now this is NFK beta and IFK beta. Now this is NFK beta and NFK beta attaches itself to IFK beta, sorry IK beta. Now what is IK beta is? IK beta is an inhibitor of NFK beta. So whenever these two are attached, it will not allow NFK beta to work. Okay. What happens is that first of all, corticosteroid is going to attack NFK beta as a direct binding. It will bind NFK beta, the free NFK beta and neutralize it. So free NFK beta, which is, uh, which is without the IK beta. Okay. So let me just make it a bit simpler. NFK beta and IK beta, uh, beta exists in a complex. And whenever IK beta is attached to NFK beta, it cannot work. So NFK beta has to free itself from IK beta to carry out its effect. Okay. So when NFK beta detaches itself from IK beta, it's going to migrate to do DNA response elements. And this will lead to increased translation of various molecules and inflammatory cytokines. But the free NFK beta gets bound by steroid molecule and is not able to do this process. Thus, the inflammatory cytokines are reduced. Clear? So NFK beta with IK beta forms a complex, not able to do its function. NFK beta detaches itself to IK beta, becomes active, goes into nucleus attached to DNA response element, lead to formation of cytokine. Now corticosteroid, it binds to free NFK beta and doesn't allow it to go into nucleus for its effect. Additionally, corticosteroid increases the binding of IFK beta to NFK beta and thus inactivating NFK beta, further decreasing the cytokine production. Clear? Now, the uh, because of this, uh, additionally, we can see that uh, the immunosuppressive cytokines is decreased. And this process is a part of genomic actions of steroid. One action is known as translatory action. And that we see in glucocorticoid receptors. While the other action is known as trans repression. Let me write it in properly. So, genomic effects are two kinds. Transactivation and then trans repression. Okay. So, transactivation is through the glucocorticoid receptors, trans repression is through the NFK, NFK beta, IK beta complex. One way to remember is transactivation. Because of glucocorticoid receptors, it activates the anti-inflammatory cytokines. Okay. Trans repression comes from the word suppression. That means using NFK beta, it suppresses the formation of inflammatory cytokines. Okay. So genomic effects, two types, transactivation, trans suppression, trans activation through glucocorticoid receptors, which includes increasing anti-inflammatory cytokines and trans repression is through NFK beta, IK beta complexes which leads to suppression of release of inflammatory cytokine. Okay, so just two words to remember. Now, another way that steroid acts is by through the pathway of activating protein 1. Activating protein 1. The function of the activating protein 1 is nearly the same as NFK beta and NFK B the action is increased through inflammatory cytokines. So that is what activating protein 1 does. Additionally, it secretes a molecule known as interferon regulatory factor 3 and this interferon regulatory factor 3 is responsible for proper activation of innate immunity. So if we inhibit activating protein 1, this will lead to inhibition of interferon regulatory factor 3 and decrease in innate immunity. Along with that, there will be decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines and that is because the action is somewhat similar to NFKB. Okay, 
and whenever uh, in subsequent slides we'll be discussing the effect of steroids on other cell lines and uh, we'll realize that uh, it suppresses other cell lines also and the effect on humoral immunity is somewhat it's a lot more than its effect on innate immunity so both branches of immunity get suppressed by steroid but humoral immunity is more suppressed as compared to innate immunity and additionally the nk cells which are important part of innate immunity are also suppressed by steroid we'll be discussing two slides further Now other action of steroid is apoptosis induction. Apoptosis is cell death which is natural cell death, a natural process by which any cell which, which is not useful for the body or not carrying its normal function will be destroyed and let go of. Now steroids are responsible for the apoptosis of autoreactive T cells, neoplastic T cells and eosinophils. So when autoreactive T cells die, it leads to the, the stabilization of autoimmune diseases. If neoplastic T cells die, that means the T cell lymphomas and other malignancies. That is why steroids are helpful in other malignancy management also. And eosinophils, which we see in parasitic infections or urticaria or other eosinophilic mediated disorders, steroids have an additional effect of inducing apoptosis in those cells. Now, how do steroids do this kind of uh, action on these cells? Majorly, major mechanism is that all these cytokines which are responsible for activation of these cells are being secreted by the normal translational and transcription mechanisms now steroid by its action on glucocorticoid receptor blocks these receptors and the translations and those cytokines are not available number one number two other cytokines which were initially produced by nfkb is now not produced because it is inhibited by steroids and because of that all the activating cytokines are decreased and thus the cytokine responsible for activation of T cell is also decreased and because of that the T cell dies. It doesn't get activated, it dies. So that is a purpose induction. Additionally, we know that CD3 is an important bio CD3 is an important biomarker of T cell. And if that gets activated, the T cell is activated. If the steroid molecule down regulates CD3, and when CD3 is down regulated, it does not lead to activation of T cell. T cell remains inactive and an inactive cell is useless for the body and the cell dies. So this is how it induces apoptosis in T cells. So rest in peace T cell. Signal transduction. Now remember that phospholipase is responsible for secretions of various other molecules like leukotrienes, eicosanoids, all these molecules are responsible as secondary messengers for various other receptors messengers and also they are responsible for multiple inflammatory pathways inflammatory pathways what steroid does is it inhibits the phospholipase a2 via increasing lipoprotein which is also known as annexin so it steroid molecule increases lipoprotein Steroid molecules increase in lipoprotein and this increase in lipoprotein inhibits or decreases phospholipase A2 leading to decrease in leukotrienes and eicosanoids. Okay, so eicosanoids are decreased. Further, it decreases COX-2 enzyme and because of that, it leads to further improvement in inflammatory pathways and pain. Okay. Now, vascular effects. What effect do steroid molecules have on vessels? So, up, so it decreases angiogenesis and that is why it inhibits wound healing. The wound are not properly healed because of this. Increase vasoconstriction and also increase response to, cat, to catecholamines. Catecholamines. Okay. So we know that catecholamines or certain um, certain catecholamines acting on certain receptors lead to vasoconstriction and it increases vasoconstriction by itself. Steroid increases vasoconstriction and also steroid inc increases the response of vessels to catecholamines. So all these disorders in which there is cutaneous intense vasodilation, steroid has an additional benefit on that. Further, it decreases permeability and the decreased response to histamine we know that histamine increases vascular permeability vascular permeability 
and if that response is decreased by corticosteroid there will be decrease in vascular permeability and thus help it's helpful in edema and also wheels in urticaria and how it does that it decreases e selectin and intracellular adhesion molecule 1 and that is responsible for either the migration and diapedesis of inflammatory cells through the vessel wall or the interjunction between endothelial cells and when these two are decreased it becomes a much tighter junction and thus the permeability is also decreased. Okay, so now in, in brief we are going to study the effect of steroids on various immune cells and this is how uh, the, the end factor or the downstream effect of steroid happens on inflammation. So we will discuss one one cell each in brief, B cells. High corticosteroid dose, dose inhibits B cells and thus there is decrease in antibody formation and that is why in disorders like LD pemphigus we have decreased B cell activity on steroids. That's how they act. In T cells the action is more on CD4 and CD8 cells and it occurs on lower doses. So initially T cells are inhibited and on higher doses B cells are inhibited. And that is why if, uh, in few slides before I said that humoral immunity inhibition is more than innate immunity inhibition on corticosteroids. Clear? Now furthermore steroid increases regulatory T cells. So all the T regs are increased. If regulatory T cells are increased the immune modulation happens and the auto-inflammatory or autoimmune disorders are somewhat suppressed. It also decreases interleukin-2 and interleukin-2 is a very important pro-inflammatory cytokine and what is special about interleukin-2 is that it has its own positive feedback mechanism. It leads to formation of more interleukin-2 and more interleukin-2 receptors. So decreasing a very important inflammatory cytokine has a good anti-inflammatory effect. Now in the previous slide as we have discussed, natural killer cells are also decreased. And polymorphic nucleosides, this decreased margination, that means attachment to the endothelial cells of the capillaries, decreased chemotaxis, that means decreased mig uh, migration to the site of inflammation, and also paradoxically it decreases apoptosis. Now, Wolverton mentions this as a paradoxical effect of steroid, but paradoxically it decreases the the apoptosis of polymorphic nucleus cells but it is also decreasing the margination and migration of cells. So the net effect is an immunosuppressive one. In mast cells there is decreased degranulation so all the mast cell disorders are also uh, controlled by steroids. In monocytes and macrophages there is decreased maturation and also access to inflammatory cytokines. They are not able to access the activatory signals from inflammatory cytokines and thus they are decreased. In fibroblasts there is decreased collagen formation and decreased fibrofibrin generation and because of that we see effects or side effects like atrophy. Also we see how steroids act in in uh, disorders like keloids or hypertrophic scars and how do they actually help because their action on fibroblast leads to decreased collagen production. Other cells like Langerhans cells, eosinophil, macrophages, the steroids decrease number, they decrease the function, decrease the recruitment of these cells at the site of inflammation. Now one more action which I need to mention here is increased production of CCL 20. Now CCL20 is a homing molecule. What do we mean by homing molecule? Homing molecule means that there are certain molecules which are supposed to guide inflammatory cells towards the skin. Home the cells towards the skin. Those are known as homing molecules. Now steroid increases CCL20 and because of that the inflammatory cells are migrated to the skin and there is a paradoxical increase in steroid sorry in inflammation. A paradoxic inflammation and this mechanism has been touted or has been um, given for the activation uh, the increased inflammation in, in the papillopustular rosacea and also in periorbital dermatitis which sometimes gets aggravated when steroids are given so this is a counterintuitive mechanism of increased inflammation 
or a flare up of inflammation when steroids are given then that is because of increased production of ccl20 now here is the mnemonic which you can use to just remember the headings and further further division or further description you can easily do by just naming one one cell or one one point from each so vistara is a very famous tata airlines so v stands for the effect on the vessels i stands for all the immune cells and their effects s stands for signal transduction ta stands for the transcript transcription factors like uh, nfk beta and other transcription factors along with activating protein 1 r is receptor activation which is glucocorticoid receptor which is the most important way the mechanisms of the steroid act and also one of the major pathways for adverse events of with steroid and a stands for apoptosis induction so this becomes vistara you will be easily able to remember the headings and can easily write at length about the mechanism of action of steroids now these are the uses and we will not delve much time on uses the reason being that steroids are used virtually everywhere everywhere wherever the inflammation or the inflammatory pathway or the inflammatory cells are implicated we can use steroids so we are not going to go into much details detail about uh, the use of steroids in various disorders it, you can go at length and name nearly any disorder and you will find steroids being used there we will just uh, somewhat remember the headings as usual so bullous dermatosis which includes pemphigus vulgaris bullous pemphigoid mmp herpes gestationis epidermolysis bullosa equisita linear iga sgs em major autoimmune connective tissue like le ellie dermatomyositis smithsonian process these are all just name just remember the headings okay we will just talk about headings i will i am not going to spend much time on uses this can easily be recalled so bullous dis disorders autoimmune ctds vasculitis neutrophilic dermatosis we all know that pyoderma gangrenosum melts away with steroid dermatitis or papillomatous disorders never ever mention psoriasis the only indication of systemic steroid for psoriasis as per me is debilitating joint involvement and that too with recent biologicals that indication is slowly also going okay so for systemic steroids the only indication in my book is only debilitating joint involvement now other dermatitis like contact dermatitis atopic dermatitis very helpful exfoliative erythroderma and lichen planus very helpful other dermatitis like dress syndrome sarcoidosis photodermatitis a severe urticaria not being controlled with antihistamines additionally autoimmune urticaria uh, androgen uh, prevention of isotretinoin induced acne fulminans multiple times we see that in patients that we start isotretinoin there is a initial flare up and steroids or a short duration uh, high dose steroids or a longer duration low dose steroids can be given to control that flare up now here we i would like to discuss in brief the policy of treat and retreat treat and retreat means go in give steroids control the disease and then taper off and remove patient from steroids and the term that i use is hit and retreat hit means educate action no half hearted measures proper steroid doses give the patient steroids significant amount for a very short duration control the disease activity slowly taper off while you shift the patient if it's a self limiting disorder make sure that the patient is recovering if it's not a self limiting disorder do all the investigation and shift the patient to other immunosuppressive drugs okay so this is how i would like to treat patients of steroid responsive dermatosis is to give them adequate steroid dose in initially control the disease activity shift the patient to other immunosuppressants while the immunosuppressant takes care of disease steroid is being tapered in the background and then the patient is maintained on immunosuppressants till the clinical activity is there clear now just a brief mention about the use of uh, intramuscular administration of steroids and this table gives you a lot of points regarding the difference between oral administration and intramuscular administration and you can easily understand the different modes of administration 
when absorption is concerned, it is reasonably predictable because you know how much steroid you're going to give. In intramuscular administration, is highly variable from patient to patient, number one. And also it depends on either the muscle activity and the blood flow to the muscle. A lot of factors are involved, so it can be highly variable and unpredictable. Now, oral administration, the compliance is an issue because you don't know if the patient has taken the drug or not, how much they have taken. But intramuscular, it is virtually guaranteed because you are the one prescribing the steroid. So you know how much you are injecting and you have injected on time. Clear? Duration of therapy is any duration possible. But in intramuscular, it should be short. Uh, because if you go for a longer intramuscular injection, it, it carries a very important risk of HPA, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis suppression. So the duration has to be shorter. Steroid, you can, oral steroids, you can manipulate to a good extent. It requires a cooperative GI tract that means the patient should be accepting orally and there should not be any problem with GI tract affecting the absorption. But if the patient has nausea, vomiting or any other problem, give intramuscular steroid. Requires active participation of the patient because patient has to take it by themselves. Requires passive role, you can even inject when the patient is not even conscious. Physician level of control can vary, it depends on how importantly you counsel the, them. and. Uh, here the patient can be a physician can be absolutely certain that the patient has received the medication because they have given it okay reproduces the diurnal variation so remember that uh, there is increased cortisol pulse in the morning every every uh, in everybody okay and we try to mimic this increased endogenous steroid by giving an early morning dose so early morning, roughly at about 8 a.m. Or, or around that, just after patient has had breakfast to prevent any nausea, vomiting or gastritis, we can give steroid. And this pulse, okay, this pulse is what we are kind of mimicking, okay. So oral steroids, they, uh, there's always an indication whether you can give divided doses of oral steroids or not. You can, you can divide the steroids into morning and evening dose. But trust me, that is not a good way of giving steroid. It leads to much more side effects because then also you will have an increased evening pulse. Okay. The graph would look somewhat like this. So you will have a morning pulse and an evening pulse if you are dividing the doses. This is not how body produces cortisol. Body produces cortisol roughly at about 2 a.m. The highest level, the level starts to increase by 2 a.m. So we need to mimic that. And for that, we give early morning dose only. And I have not given divided doses of oral steroids in any patient. Okay. So give early morning dose so that it mimics the natural steroid secretion. And this can be achieved by oral. But in intramuscular steroid administration, it keeps on leaking from the muscle into the circulation. So there's a somewhat a constant level of steroid. So this pulse nature is not maintained. This pulsatile nature of normal steroid excretion is not maintained in intramuscular steroids and tapering may you can do precise tapering it gradual tapering is there because drug is slowly slowly being metabolized from the site now some complications relatively unique to intramuscular steroids and these include injection site fold abscess significant fat atrophy that we you we very routinely see Crystal deposition. Now, this is the reason why there have been few case reports that injection of normal saline takes care of steroid atrophy. Uh, personally, I don't think so. That happens in normal saline. It does. It doesn't have a volume effect, so that atrophy is not taken care of. Number one, the mechanism is touted as that it dissolves the crystal. It dissolves. Wait, you have to write it very slowly. It dissolves the steroid crystals and slowly, slowly the, uh, the blood, the body clears the crystals out. And gradually, uh, since the inhibition on fib uh, fibroblasts is taken care of, the atrophy improves. So that is the one mechanism of action it is given. Apart from that, menstrual irregularities and purpura, which can be seen with any mechanism of uh, any administration of high dose steroids. Now, how do we monitor steroids? Uh, see, I will not discuss this in detail because the video is itself getting long. Number one, 
Number two, if we know the side effects of steroids, we'll be able to better monitor it. So it's better to discuss this segment when we'll be discussing the adverse events of steroids. Just remember that in baseline, blood pressure, weight monitoring is very important. If you're dealing with pediatric patients, you need to take care of the height and weight and plot in a WHO growth chart. So you can just see whether the patient is growing normally as per their age or not. Ophthalmic examination of cataract along with glaucoma. Remember that glaucoma rate or risk increases when a patient surpasses the age of 35 as per the national guidelines. So if you are treating a patient more than 35, it's better to just get an ophthalmic evaluation for glaucoma if the patient complains of symptoms of glaucoma or there is a family history, number one. Number two, whenever you are giving high dose steroids like uh, uh, either either uh, OMP or in cases of DCPs or DPs, do a torch light examination and find if your patient has cataract or not. It's so easy. You can easily pick up cataract and get an ophthalmic evaluation done. Tuberculosis screening becomes very important in India. IGRA is preferred more than tuberculosis skin test. Viral markers. Now strongyloides. That is very important. Uh, in a patient who has strong alerts in GIT, using steroids can lead to, uh, you, you can say, a sudden increase in strong alerts in the system. And if strong alerts get, gets access to the bloodstream, it leads to what is known as a fulminant infection of strong alerts and it is fatal. So make sure in a country like India where stronger infection can be easily seen before starting any IV pulse therapy or high dose steroids get a stool routine microscopy for ova and cyst done and consider stronger lord infection when you have patients of peptic ulcer disease not responding that much with PPIs proton pump inhibitors uh, there is one I'll tell you one story I had a patient not I had, the institute had a patient of Hansen's disease and I was a JR second semester and the patient has significant stomach pain and there was an ulcer diagnosed on endoscopy and thankfully the gastroenterologist took a biopsy from the ulcer and the biopsy showed strong alerts and I remember the gastro person giving us a call, I was on call at night and he gave me a call that I can see strong alerts in the biopsy you need to stop high dose steroids and we were giving that Hansen patient high dose steroid to control his type 2 ENL reaction which was not getting controlled by doses of uh, Vicelin so we were giving high dose steroids along with thalidomide and so at that given point of time we started ivermectin therapy and made sure that the person survived and this led to my first publication so I remember the story very correctly so remember to screen for strong alerts in endemic areas and India is endemic Fasting glucose or HbA1c and triglyceride levels has to be done. Potassium level, bone densitometry, DEXA, annual DEXA scan for patient on high dose steroid is recommended. You have to do a DEXA scan. We'll discuss DEXA scan in little bit detail while we'll be discussing adverse event. Start calcium around 1200 or you can go as high as 200 milligram a day in divided doses along with vitamin D 800 international units. I give us a bit larger dose, roughly around 1200, 1000, sorry, 1200 to 1500 because uh, Indians are somewhat deficient in vitamin D, so it's better to give a bit higher doses. But 800 to 1200 is good enough. Initiate proton pump inhibitor for any stomach issues. Okay, if there's any stomach pain, stomach issues, start proton pump inhibitors. Now, if you are giving steroids above physiological dose, at every hospital visit or monthly visit, do a blood pressure, weight, height and weight in pediatric population and give take history of uh, any adverse events. Okay, And every six months, the ophthalmic evaluation for cataracts and glaucoma is recommended so that we can catch early and prevent. Potassium levels, fasting glucose and fasting triglyceride levels are important. We'll discuss them a little bit detail while we're discussing the adverse event. 
and near the time of stopping long term pharmacological dose a serum cortisol am level then should be done at 8 am so serum cortisol measured at 8 am and if the value is less than 10 uh, that means body is not able to initiate its own formation of steroids okay if the body is creating its own natural steroid the levels will be more than 10 but early morning before the dose of steroid that you have given you will be giving before the dose of steroids if you measure at 8 am and you have stopped steroid one day prior the body if it shows less than 10 uh, then uh, cortisol level that means hpa axis is suppressed and patient will not be able to form its own steroid adequately and you will have to provide maintenance therapy if this comes out to be more than 10 no maintenance is as required for pulse IV therapy, cardiac monitoring is responsible because, sorry, is, is uh, recommended because arrhythmias is one more one major side effect of IV pulse therapy. This can be mitigated by a slow IV infusion over two to three hours rather than the one hour that we usually do. Electrolyte and glucose levels to be done uh, daily for the all, whole three days of pulse. What we used to do was before uh, every pulse, we do used to have a, a new sodium and potassium counts. Okay, so with that, after uh, such a long, a long uh, video on the effect and mechanism of action and the physiological effects of corticosteroid in the body, we'll be taking a break and next week we'll be discussing in part two all the adverse events of long-term steroid, uh, steroid uh, administration and how to look for these adverse events and how to manage these adverse events. That is why I divided it into parts so that uh, first part will just take care of all the pharmacology and uses and second part will discuss the adverse event because it is the adverse events which kind of limits our use of steroids it is such a powerful drug so we should be very comfortable in using steroids for their required duration so if you have any doubts any other questions in the previously discussed topics you can email me anytime on this email id or you can just comment any doubts any questions which you have been asked in viva or exams that you would like to know the answers so ask them in the comments and i'll try to get back to you as soon as i can clear so we'll meet we'll meet again next week when we'll be discussing the adverse events of steroids in the part two of this lecture series okay so adios and bye bye